Of the Body Condemned, Chapter 1, Execution By Lady of Rosefire and Sparks Rites By decree of Her Majesty, the Bright Queen Leila's Kryn, Umavi, Empress of the Kryn Dynasty of Jorhas, Essek, formerly Thalys, formerly Shadowhand, is to be taken this day to a place of public execution. If his friends have any say, he will not stay there. Tags 4 Graphic depictions of violence, execution, road hauling, torture, aftermath of torture, flogging, hanging, strangulation, gibbets, vomiting, urination, fighting, rescue missions, crying, healing, hurt slash comfort, hair petting, tea, nightmares, emotional hurt slash comfort, womp, dislocations, bruises, trauma, near death, tenderness, physiotherapy, and hand holding. When the dynasty is sure, it has wrung all it can from him. They drag Essek out from the dungeon of penance and into the eternal twilight of Rosona's streets. Even the half-light blinds him after his time in the dungeon, spent in darkness thick enough to blind even a drow. With his magic muffled by the cuffs around his wrists, he cannot tell how long has passed, how long he was down there in the dark, hurting and alone. Weeks, certainly. The dungeon has enchantments woven into its very fabric, though, to confuse the senses, to disorientate. It could have been months, blurred over by the background radiation of raw dunamis, or days stretched into a hellish eternity. It was time enough for his body to be broken and healed more than once, though. Time enough for his mind to break away in scraps and chunks from the pain, from the isolation. Time enough for exhaustion to weigh heavy on his limbs and make him slow and clumsy. When they tie Essex mangled hands to a chain leading from the back of a cart, he is too weak to do anything but follow as it is pulled into the streets. Even if he had the strength to run, the will to run, his guards, his torturers, his erstwhile subordinates follow close behind. The only way they leave him is forward. The cart turns towards the Shadow Shire. He squeezes his eyes shut against the light, stumbling on unsteady legs. No glorious beheading in front of the castle, then. No chance to beg forgiveness from the queen and be reborn anew. He is to be fed to the mob. The clamor of the commoners reaches him a moment later. Essek blinks open watering eyes and stumbles again. The wall of sound hits him like a physical entity, and he flinches from it instinctively. He would like to hold his head high, to walk straight behind the cart, but he can barely lift his feet. His bare toes catch on a loose stone in the road, and he falls to one knee. The onlookers roar their approval. A half-rotted melon splatters against his shoulder, slimy and sour, seeping through the rags of his shirt. His face burns. Essek grits his teeth and forces himself back to his feet. The dull throb from his brain knee sharpens on his next step forward. They healed him enough so that he could stand for this, but perhaps not well enough to walk. Perhaps just enough to make walking painful. The dynasty, it seems, has put quite some thought into stuffing his final moments as full of petty cruelties as they can. He lacks the energy to be impressed. The cart picks up speed. He makes it maybe 30 seconds before his legs give out again, the speed too much for injured knees and bare, unsteady feet. He falls again. This time, he is dragged for the length of his body before he draws his knees up, ripping first his pants and then his skin on the rough stones of the road. He stumbles back to his feet, trips, catches himself. His hands jar against the ropes, sending pain lacing through his raw wrists and broken fingers. A precaution, his old second had said as he snapped each one in turn, as though the heavy cuffs on his wrist did not already prevent him from casting. He blinks, and he is back in the dungeon, dark and cloying and full of hurting. He blinks again crowd roars back to life, 
He still hurts everywhere, unrelenting. He thinks, for a wild moment, that he might be losing his mind. And he remembers it does not matter. He will be dead within the hour, after all. A stone strikes his shoulder hard enough to knock him off balance. A voice in the crowd screams obscenities at him, high and cutting over the general jeering. He pitches forward, cracking both elbows on the stone, scraping open his forearms and one cheek. What is left of his shirt tears as he twists feebly, drags at his screaming hands until he can fight his way upright, head tucked to his chest against the hail of filth. The third time Essek falls, he realizes that they do not expect him to stand. Body jarring, shoulders screaming as his arms are jerked out in front of him, he hits <clears throat> the road once more. He does not have the strength to try and stand. For all that he does not love these people, and has never felt any particular loyalty toward them, it still stings. More than he expected, it hurts that they would make his torture so public. He ducks his head against one arm, keeping his face clear from the scrape of the road, and does his best to protect his eyes. The pain in his shoulders grows, with each foot, tendons, and muscles straining, ripping. His joints are drawn apart, dislocated in slow, agonizing inches by the dead weight of his broken body and the relentless progress of the cart. The strain on his chest constricts his lungs, making him fight for breath. He tries to raise his face from his arm and catches a stone to the temple hard enough to white out his vision. His head pounds and swims. Ahead of him, the cart bounces over a rock, jostling his wrists, his shoulders. He fails to lift his head up, too weak, too hurting, too busy hiding his eyes from more stones and rotting food, and it cracks against his jaw a second later with a noise like a gunshot. Hot pain explodes through his face. The snap of it shoots all the way through his skull, down his spine, and he screams, ah! chokes, and tastes ah! copper. <laughs> He blacks out, for a second, and is ripped back to consciousness by the feeling of the road sanding the skin from his cheek. The crowd howls louder at the noise, baying their approval. He drills blood through his shattered jaw. Screaming makes the pain worse, but it hurts. Hurts more than until a few days ago he would have said more than anything in his life. He knows better than that now. But it hurts more than he can bear in silence, more than he can take without tears streaming down his bloody cheeks. His teeth are wrong in his mouth, his tongue tastes of iron filings and salt. It's the lack of air that stops him from screaming, eventually. He cannot get enough with his shoulders pulled up and his weight bearing down on them and his chest. His screams trail off to whimpers, gasps, half muffled in his arm. Essek nearly sobs with relief when the cart finally stops. It's short-lived. The pain flares as rough hands scoop him up, one under either arm. His shoulders scream in protest, the joints loose, bone grinding against displaced bone. The scaffold stands before him, towering above the crowd. If there were anything in his stomach, he would have thrown it up at the sight. He groans as his feet strike the bottom step, no energy left to lift them in even a mockery of walking. Each stair they drag him up cracks against his shins, his ankles. Still, he finds the strength to struggle when they reach the platform. A deep, instinctual terror of the whipping pole, the noose rises up until he twists in their grip, trying to pull away. For just a moment, he pushes against the guard's hold on him, until one churns and slams an armored fist into his jaw. The pain blinds him once more. The agony of it is bright, phosphorescent, stealing the breath from his lungs and all thoughts of struggle from his head. He slumps back into the guard's hands, heaving and sopping, bloody spit dripping down his chin from his misshapen mouth. <laughs> The guards loop his cuffs over a hook on the scaffold before dropping him. 
He doesn't have the energy to try and catch himself, knees cracking against the hardwood of the platform. One of his shoulders wrenches, pops, and he can't tell whether it's been mutely dislocated or just dislocated further. The pain blurs into one, a haze of agony that flares with every inhale. He's not sure whether he's crying or not, but he suspects he is. Any hope he might have had of retaining some dignity, any dignity, disappears the moment the whip touches his back. He manages one lash, two, without screaming. That, at least, is something. Each crack of the whip lights a line of bloodied fire across his skin, but it is the wet feel of blood dribbling down his spine that sets him sobbing again in the end, heaving for breath against the pain. He is too hurt, too tired to tolerate anything more. And the blood, the blood is too much. It is more than he can bear in the smallest possible way. His torture doesn't stop at his sobbing. It does not stop, in fact, for a long time after the point where he starts screaming. The broken jaw is almost a mercy. If he cannot form words, at least he cannot beg them to stop. Beg for forgiveness. It is kind of them, Isaac thinks, delirious with pain, to spare him that final and greatest humiliation. He cannot see where the queen sits, or if she has only sent one of her dignitaries to oversee this. He cannot see whether his mother is here to watch him die after she disowned him. He cannot see anything through the white, hot haze of pain. They do not stop until Essex slumps against the whipping post, knees half sliding out from under him in the slick of his own blood. He groans softly at the reprieve around his swollen tongue, the shattered distortion of his jaw. A coarse loop of rope drops around his <gasps> neck. No noble silk for him, then. A commoner's noose for a common trader. They untie his hands, and if he had any energy to thrash, he would, but he does not. And so he stays slumped as they hoist him up to his knees, his feet, higher. He sways as he rises a puppet on a string. The rope tightens around his neck, and he chokes in slow, painful inches. He had thought there was no more fight left in him. The visceral feeling of the life being throttled from his battered body proves him wrong. The slow creep of death gives him the energy to kick, to claw at the rope around his throat with broken fingers, to struggle desperately for solid ground in the barest sip of air. It does him no good. But he cannot stay still, not as his vision pulses red and black and a rushing starts up in his ears. Isaac does not know how long they hold him there, suspended in the air, twisting like a fish on a hook. He only knows that, as the black begins to close in, they drop him to the platform once again, gasping. His throat is bruised, swollen enough that he has to pant for every desperate breath, sprawled face down against the wood without the strength to hold himself up. He is fairly sure he's pissed himself. Beyond the rushing still in his ears, he hears the baying approval of the crowd, hungry for his pain. He is not sure how much more he has to give them before his body gives in entirely. That he has survived this far after weeks of torture is an unfortunate miracle gifted to him by some cruel god. Someone, somewhere, is talking voice echoing over the roar of the gathered masses. Essex's head throbs too much for him to make out the words. He is a creature of stripped nerves and raw, bloody meat. When he's hauled up by the arms yet again, he can barely manage a weak groan. There's blood in his mouth and his eyes wet beneath his fingers. Every inch of him is bruised, broken, twisted, crimson slit. He wonders whether finally, finally, they will let him die. He has been praying for death for weeks now. Instead, 
we shove him inside an iron cage in the shape of a body. It is a challenge getting his twisted limbs and battered form to settle properly inside the structure, but they persevere. Essek vomits thin bile and dark blood as they twist one shoulder to settle it inside the cage. His torturers are unperturbed, arranging his other arm with a force bordering on enthusiasm. He feels the drag of the dunamantic spellwork before they even get the door locked. His stomach heaves. He closes his eyes against the weight of it, choking on the breath in his lungs. Dunamancy is an old friend, an intimate companion. It has never felt like this before, heavy and cruel. When he forces his eyes open again, the crowd moves in slow motion. Every aching beat of his heart comes so slowly he thinks it might never come at all. Each time, he hopes, waits, prays for it to stop and release him. Each time, it beats. They hang his cage outside the beacon's range and leave him burning under the morning light. Hey everyone, thank you so much for listening. Make sure to go check out this fic if you have not read it. Link is in the description. Stay tuned for chapter two.